Welcome, everyone, to Coffee with a Codex. Um, my name is Dot Porter. I am the curator uh, for digital research services at the Schoenberg Institute. Um, no, that's not true. I'm, I, I got to do it right. I'm the curator for digital research services at the Kislak Center for Special Collections, Rare Books, and Manuscripts, the University of Pennsylvania Libraries. And I split my time with the Schoenberg Institute uh, for a manuscript studies. Um, although I am a medievalist and um, I do most of my work here with pre-modern manuscripts, digital humanities, um, and outreach like Copy with a Codex. So if you are new, welcome. If you've been here before, welcome back. Um, Coffee with a Codex is our weekly 30-minute show and tell where I pull a book or sometimes more off the shelf and uh, show them off. I am oftentimes not an expert um, in the content of the books, uh, as is the case today, although I've done a little bit of prep, um, so I'm hoping that this will be uh, good for all of us. What we're going to be looking at today is actually four copies of um, a text uh, that in Latin is called the Secretum Secretorum, or the Secret of Secrets, and it was supposed to be um, a sort of uh, treatise or a you know letter or document written from um, Aristotle to um, uh, Alexander the Great, his his pupil um, when Aristotle was very old and Alexander was out conquering the world. And so he wrote him this uh, great letter about all kinds of things, uh, which I'll get into uh, momentarily. It was incredibly popular um, in both in the Middle East and in the West, um, sort of through the Middle Ages. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. What we're looking at here is the earliest copy that we have um, in our collection. Um, I put in the link, um, links to all of these four manuscripts that we're going to be looking at, links to the catalog records. The first one is LJS uh, 459, which is actually the second one in the list. And um, Amy, if you wouldn't mind sort of pasting them in again uh, as you get a chance, that would be great. Um, this is the earliest one. Um, this manuscript is actually from, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Um, oh, come on. Here we go. This one was written in Mosul, Iraq, we think, between 1193 and 1211 in the Western calendar. Um, and the reason that we think that is because on the very first page, there is this um, highly decorated um, name and title of, um, what is his name? Uh, Nur al-Din Arslan Shah, who was um, the Turkmen leader in Mosul, Iraq, between those dates, sort of late 12th, early 13th century. And so we believe that, that this was um, written for him. It is in Arabic. It is uh, written on paper. And this is not, it's almost complete, but not quite complete. So it cuts off uh, towards the end. Now, I want to go back to saying sort of what the, what the topic of this, like what would Aristotle uh, write to Alexander the Great? Whereas, first of all, he didn't, right? Like this is what we call sort of pseudo-Aristotelian. Um, this was not Aristotle. This was somebody else. Uh, and I looked into it, and actually the, the, the history of it is pretty interesting. So um, it was... If, if you if you look in the top in the in the contents, it starts with a preface um, by the sort of person who says, "I found this and I'm compiling it." Um, and then it has a second introduction um, that is again supposed to be by um, a person named Yaha, uh, sorry, Yahya Ibn al Bitrik, who flourished around eight fifteen and who was known to have been a translator of Greek philosophic texts. So this was a person who we know 
uh, did actually translate Aristotle and other Greek texts. And in this supposed introduction, he says, hey, I, I found this and this is really great. And so I'm going to translate it. Um, it is, this is also a pseudo, a su what we call a pseudo text, right? This was not the, written by this guy. It was written by somebody else. Um, but this is something that happened um, pretty frequently. You know, one way, uh, whereas today uh, we worry about plagiarism a lot. We worry about people copying other people's work. Um, in the Middle Ages, it was more like, I'm going to pretend that I am somebody else. And if you think that Aristotle wrote this, you're more likely to read it. It would be like if I wrote a short story and I said Stephen King wrote it, then you might be more likely to read that, right? Um, so kind of like that, uh, which is sort of interesting. So it has these introductions. And then, of course, Aristotle's introduction. And then uh, I think he's got 10 or 11 books on, it's mostly about um, leadership, right? So there's sections on kings, on the position and the character of a king, um, a lot about that, uh, including health. There's astrology in here. Book three is on justice. We have a book on ministers, so how you choose the people who serve under you. Um, sections on scribes, on ambassadors, on governors, on army officers, on the conduct of war. And the last section is on the occult sciences, um, which has sections on talismans, alchemy, and then ends on and then herbal. And that is kind of interesting for us because if we go to the very end of this first one, which is LJS, um, what did I say? 459. This is the first one and our earliest copy. Oh, I forgot. It's got, this is the one that has this guy. So this is not a robot. This is a bell, but I love him because he looks to me like a little, like someone you'd see in Star Wars, like a little robot. But I've been reassured that it's not. Um, so somewhere we have Aristotle, I guess, talking about bells. And then I will point out that there are some later um, marginal notes here. So that's what we're seeing here. It's also been, it looks like it's been in a rainstorm or something. There's a lot of damage around the edges. But when we get to the end, we will see, am I, am I fibbing? Here we go. So this is the very last page. So it's in, it's in Arabic. Um, but when we get towards the end, we're going to start seeing characters that are clearly not Arabic. This is not Arabic. This is some kind of, um, uh, could be, um, let me see, it might even say in the, in this, what it's supposed to be. Um, it, right. The text breaks off during a discussion of magical alphabets. So these are supposed to be sort of magical alphabets. So that's what's happening here. So we are close to the end, um, but we're not to the end. So there's a section of this that's missing um, at the end. But if we look, then we can get a sense of the length of the whole of the whole text. This is mostly this, this entire text from the start to the end. Um, so because we don't have a lot of time and I do actually want to show you all four of them, um, we're going to move on. So this is our earliest one, uh, late 12th, early 13th century. Next one that I'm going to show you is also an Arabic translation. This is LJS 456. And it is a little bit later. Um, and whereas the first one, that one was written in Iraq, in Mosul, this one we think was written in Andalusia, which is in Spain. Um, in 14, uh, sorry, 1394 or AH uh, 797. So AH, that's the um, Islamic date. And there is a colophon. Oh, let me, let me zoom out a little bit here. That's that. Is that a little bit? There we go. So there's a colophon on uh, 22. So we'll get to the colophon, but that's how we know the date because it's actually signed by the scribe, uh, which doesn't always um, 
doesn't always happen. So I'm checking the chat really quick. Okay, that's just um, things. If you do have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and I will get to them. So this clearly, this has had a little bit of work done to it. So the original uh, paper pages um, have been set in this sort of modern um, modern paper. And we can, we can tell that this is only a fragment. And there's a couple of different ways. One is that it's only 22, it's 22 leaves. So if you remember the other one we saw, it was quite thick, it was bigger, um, but this is still not um, the whole thing. And it's got sort of early page numbering or folio numbering. So 169, there's a whole section that came before um, that is missing. So we are somewhere in the middle, um, actually towards the end. Um, I love this. I think this is so neat. Um, this script is um, different from, so the earlier one was in a Nask script, which we see a lot. It, that's sort of the Middle Eastern script. This is um, a different script. Maghrabi, I can never uh, say it right. Maghrebi script. Um, so this is another way that you might date um, and localize uh, the text is by the script. Um, it's just a very pretty one and the larger um, rubrics are um, very nice too. And there's some red, um, but I'm going to skip ahead a little bit so we can see more of this. Um, so this was, um, you know, I am assuming that this was at one point a much larger uh, book. I know now that we're towards the end, even though I can't read the Arabic, because again, we are running into this section with this magical um, uh, alphabet. So, um, so that's where we are now, and we start seeing some different uh, colored, um, colored letters too. A little bit of marginal. I guess there could have been a lot more marginal notes, but they've been lost because the um, because the manuscript itself was so um, so badly damaged. Um, it would be really interesting, I think, to compare these two, uh, especially since we have, we know we have these overlapping sections, um, of these. So we have one that's most of the text and then this one, which is a much smaller fragment. Um, there we go. So there's that. So these are two Arabic copies. It was originally written in Arabic, um, not in Greek. It wasn't but I don't think anyone believes it was translated. Yes. So Amy is saying that Claire Marcus has a question about the paste down paper, which is very nice. Um, the binding, it says 19th century. So, but it doesn't say anything about uh, where um, or when exactly in the 19th century. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know too much about the provenance. We, the only provenance that we have in the record is that it was sold at auction at Christie's in 2003 to Larry Schoenberg. So it's really not clear uh, where it was before then. And I don't know enough about paper craft to, I'm sure that there are people who would, would be able to look at this and sort of say more about it. Since it is, I mean, I don't, you know, I would say, so, well, since it's a flat binding, it may have been done in the Middle East, but I honestly don't know. There may have been Western bookbinders also making these types of bindings for uh, Arabic books. I don't know. I hadn't thought about that. Okay, so now we're moving from um, the Middle East into the West. And we have two copies, sort of later copies, um, but I do want to say a little bit about, about this um, translation because this this text was actually enormously popular in um, in the West throughout um, throughout Europe from um, the 12th century onward so I'm going to start with I'm trying to go in um, time order by time right so this is the next one 
So now we're into the early 15th century, or I guess the 15th century, in Germany. Both of these manuscripts um, are from Germany, although they're both Latin. So this is uh, a smaller, not a smaller copy, it's a copy of a section of it. And again, we can see that it's not the complete text because it's only um, this little section. The, uh, the text itself was partially translated from the Arabic into Latin um, around 1120. So this is the earliest that we have it in Latin. And then there was a complete translation that was made about a hundred years later. And the story about that is kind of interesting. It was in 1230 in Antioch and a Western scholar who already knew the previous translation was shown, um, was sh shown this, the complete Arabic text. Um, and he was like, hey, I know that, but I only know part of it. So he translated the whole thing and that set it off. So 1230 was the first complete translation. It was widely known in the West by the early 14th century. More than 130 Latin manuscripts survive from that earlier period, sort of the early 14th century. Um, by the time we're getting into the 15th century, there are more than a 500 Latin manuscripts um, that survive. So this, the, we have two of these 500 that survive. Um, and Albertus Magnus and Roger Bacon both quote the text among many, many others. Um, and it was just hugely influential. It's actually more, more copies survive than any other Aristotelian text. Whether, so more than anything Aristotle actually, actually wrote, there are more copies of this, which is sort of incredible. Um, so I hope you've been peeking as I've been talking. Um, and if you have, what you'll notice is that there's larger text here, and then there's sort of smaller text um, above and below, and then there's even smaller notes in between. And what this means is that we actually have a commentary on the text. So we have the, the main text is the larger text, and then the commentary is the stuff that's written around it. So not only is this a copy of a small section of that original um, text, then there's this commentary that goes along with it. Um, we see commentaries all over the place in the West. We have um, what are called glossed psalters, which is the same kind of thing where you have the text of the psalter and then the glosses or the commentary around it. Um, you have glossed um, or you know commentaries with um, philosophical texts. I don't know if you all remember, we looked at the Secrets of Women back last year that also has a lot of commentaries and commentaries become their own texts and they get translate, they get sort of copied along with the text as well. Um, so that is what's, that's what's um, happening here. I see there's something in the chat, so I'm gonna take a quick. Uh, Matthew asks, what important roles did these manuscripts play during their time, during their respective time periods? Um, so they would have been pro probably studied by theologians and philosophers uh, in their own time. They probably would have been used as um, thus as like teaching um, teaching texts for university students. Um, if you have Roger Bacon, people like Roger Bacon and uh, Albertus Magnus quoting them, you know I. I don't know a whole lot about the intellectual life, but if you then if you're reading Roger Bacon, you might want to have a copy to refer to if you see him, you know, referring to it. Um, it was just a part of part of the sort of intellectual uh, life of the times. So, yeah. So this is one of these copies, also out of interest, just because I think this is funny. On the recto of the first page is a recipe for a laxative, um, <clears throat> which just is sort of an example of the way that these books were sometimes treated, because I don't think the laxative really has anything to do with the text. It was that somebody needed to write it down quickly, and there it was. 
and I think that's sort of I think that's sort of cool. So there's that. Actually, this one also. Um, so the text itself is through seventeen, and then we have something else after this. This is um, a poem uh, on friendship that is attributed to Cicero. Um, I don't think it is actually um, by Cicero. It says it is uh, based on Cicero's De Amicitia. So um, a another sort of pseudo pseudo text that comes up um, at the end. So that's sort of interesting that these two are are written together and seem to be planned, you know, planned together. All right, one more. We have time, plenty of time. So the last one that we're going to be looking at is another 15th century German manuscript. And I like looking at German manuscripts mostly because I can always tell they're German and it makes me feel kind of smart because the German German um, writing is, or the script is, is pretty um, distinctive, even when I can't read it because it's actually pretty messy. Uh, let, me, let me zoom in a little bit more. Oop. Let's see. Okay. So this is, as we can see, another one. This is just a partial, a partial copy. This is maybe a little bit later than the first one. This is dated to the second half of um, the 15th century, so between 1450 and 1499. It's 20 leaves. Um, it doesn't say, the, the record of, of this one um, doesn't say as much about what exactly it is. So we don't know what section of the text uh, it is. It's also um, appears to be another uh, commentary. It's a little bit harder to tell because there's not much difference between the larger text and the smaller text, but I'm pretty sure that this is the main text and we also have sort of glosses between. And then this is the commentary um, here and here. Um, it does have some nice sort of colored initials there at the front, uh, which makes me think that this <clears throat> like the other one, this was sort of a planned, a planned section. It's not that there was a longer manuscript that this got pulled out of. It's that somebody said, I just want this section. Um, I would, it would be interesting to compare these and see if they're, if it's the same section, if the commentary is the same, uh, or if it's different, you know, or if it's completely different on both sides. Um, this one also has like notes down the side. So these even notes on the commentary, this is a little, little nicer. Um, and that is, and it ends with an amen, which is interesting uh, there. So <clears throat> that is really, that's a really all, all I have today with these, with these four. I just wanted to show you um, how one text could be so influential and translated and copied and recopied and commented on. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's also interesting because I was reading a book uh, about it, which I also included in the links earlier, uh, and that's open access, so you should be able to read it. But before that book, there wasn't, there wasn't actually a book about The Secret of Secrets. It wasn't really something that people studied. I think because, because it's not Aristotle, and so once they figured out, well, it's not really Aristotle, then you stop caring, even though it was clearly hugely um, influential um, in the Middle Ages. So let's see. I have a question from uh, oh, Yin, from Yin Liu. Is the magical alphabet stuff not included in the German manuscript? I don't, I don't see it here. I think this must be a different section. Um, so this is just one section of the of the text and I'm guessing that it's from the earlier part where it's more about sort of statecraft um, and how to be a good king um, and then later later is when you get the sort of weird magical 
stuff. Weird. I'm saying it's weird. They wouldn't have thought it was weird, but like the magical stuff. Um, I, I would love to actually see a Latin translation um, or a Latin manuscript that has that magical alphabet. I think that would be looking at that alphabet section and comparing it to the Arabic and Latin and also others. So this, this text was not only translated into Latin in the West, it was also translated into all kinds of um, <clears throat> vernacular languages. Um, so, yeah. So Lynn is asking, are the interlinear glosses in the same language? So it is hard to see. I think it looks like it all, I think it's all Latin. I think all of it is, it looks like Latin, those look like Latin um, to me. Amy, have you looked at this? Do you know if it's? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amy is agreeing with me that it looks like it looks like Latin. So I'm pretty sure. Um, let's see more questions. Claire, where can we learn more about the magical alphabets? Uh, you might look at the book um, that I included in the links. Um, I haven't read. I haven't had a chance to look at the whole book, but I'm sure that he talks about that, and he might have citations for you to um, to look at other places. Also, magical alphabets were kind of a thing in cryptography. So I think there's a whole lot that you could probably find if you wanted to really do a deep dive, not only here, but in other places too. Um, so Matthew asks, uh, basically, it was really common back then to take someone's work or story to use for your own work. So in, so yeah, I mean, they weren't, they didn't have the same sense of, of I think, owner, textual ownership that we do. So I don't know if it was really common, but it's something that you definitely find, especially people claiming, um, writing something that's sort of slightly Aristotelian and then saying this is Aristotle. Um, or it's not even necessarily the person who wrote it. It could be also somebody else finding it and being like, oh, this sounds like Aristotle. So I'm going to say it's him or Cicero or... Uh, whatever. Um, but yeah, it was definitely a thing that, uh, that people did uh, in a way that's re it's so different from the way that we think about, um, think about text today. Yes, and Amy, Amy put the, um, the, another link to the record there. So thank you, Amy. Um, great. So it's 1230. Exactly. So uh, I can't believe I got through all four <laughs> all four books. Usually I'm scrambling at the end, but this is great. So thank you everybody. Um, uh, and I will, I hope I'll see you all next week. You can use the same uh, link and login next week. If you want to come back, you can also register if you want, but it's been great to see everybody and I will see you again soon.